I'm very proud to be associated with uh, JPPL. It is a truly unique organization. It's the only think tank directly dedicated to strategic issues facing the Jewish people worldwide and in Israel. The fellows, many of whom are here, do absolutely world-class work on a whole range of topics in the diaspora, uh, delegitimization, relationships with China and Israel across the board. The terrific staff, uh, Avi Noam has provided some remarkable leadership. Um, I know that he's not here now, but Lady Nepsland has been a, a rock of support. Uh, Ita and her uh, administrative group have been terrific, and Barry Gelman and Rami Tal were indeed very helpful for my book. But this is a, a precious institution that deserves all of our support, and it fills an absolutely essential void. And it was the inspiration for my book. Um, it was already mentioned that my, my most important advisor uh, is my wife and uh, her presence here and throughout uh, almost 45 years of marriage has been greatly appreciated and uh, I'm so glad that she could share this moment. We live in a new century of astonishing change taking place across a wide range of human endeavors more rapidly than at any time in world history. The traditional moorings of peoples and countries are shifting before our very eyes. The ways in which we relate to each other, communicate with each other, learn, work, and shop are all undergoing dramatic changes. And my book tries to explore how these global forces of the 21st century uh, impact in particular through the prism of their relationship with the Jewish people in the diaspora and the state of Israel. We have played an outsized part in the history of the world since earliest recorded times. Never have so few accomplished so much for so many and yet been oppressed so grievously. Two Jewish commonwealths have been destroyed. We've been dispersed to the four corners of the earth, expelled from country after country, beginning in 1290 from England, suffered the worst degradation that any peoples could have imagined, with special dress, special places to live, discrimination in terms of employment, violence, being subject to mobs and dictators, culminating in the Holocaust in our own time, in which we lost two-thirds of what had been the flower of world Jewry in Europe and a third of the total Jewish population. No other people could have survived such calamities, let alone thrived and contributed to the very countries that oftentimes didn't want us. But attachment to Holy Scriptures, attachment to a return to a homeland we had twice lost, and a almost mystical sense of peoplehood have enabled us to miraculously survive and now in our era to return to the very land from which we were twice expelled and to become a vital part of history, moving from the margins of society where we were forced to live to become a centerpiece of the 21st century's history. This is indeed a genuine golden age in which it has never been better, safer, more secure, more exciting, more rewarding to be Jewish. But because we live in a, a new era with the implosion of communism, because we are still a very tiny percentage of the world, these centrifugal forces that I described have a particular impact on us. And we now face a new series of challenges. Even as we're integrated into our diaspora communities, protected by the rule of law, even as we have the strongest Jewish commonwealth in history. And what I want to explore with you briefly in 
summarizing parts of my book are those forces which I divide into to two parts, external and internal. I'm more optimistic about our capacity to deal with our external challenges. <coughs> Uh, and I think our internal challenges are ones which we can't overcome, but will require supreme effort. The first external global challenge is the dramatic shift of power and influence from Western countries, in particular the U.S. and Europe, which have sizable Jewish communities, share common values with, the United, with Israel and with Jews, have a history of relationships, to countries of the East and South, China and India, Brazil, which have no historical connections to Jews or the State of Israel, and have small or indeed non-existent Jewish communities. If the 20th century was the Atlantic century, the 21st century will certainly be the Asia-Pacific century, with a new global order quickly rising and moving the shift of power from west to east and south. It's impossible to overstate the importance of a strong America to the Jewish people and the state of Israel. <clears throat> Indeed, the security of Israel and of the United States are inextricably intertwined. The U.S. is Israel's only real ally in the world, and since the end of World War II has been the ballast to preserve some modicum of stability, growth, freedom, and tolerance. There's never been a country in our history, over 3,500 years in the diaspora, in which Jews have been more integrated and more accepted. The congressional calendar itself, for 2% of the population, is as much geared to our holidays as Christian holidays. Kosher foods are among, among the most rapidly growing sector in the United States. For virtually all of American history, we have been the ascending power, not always the most powerful until the end of World War II, but always ascending, always beginning to eclipse others. We will still be, for decades to come, the most powerful nation in the world. But the biggest change is we are no longer the ascending power. Other powers are ascending and closing the gap in every field and in every area. We now live in a unique multipolar world, unlike that in which we have ever seen in recorded history. We've had many instances of shifts of power after the Battle of Trafalgar, where particular power shifted from the Spanish and French to the British. We've had periods when two superpowers, like the U.S. and the Soviet Union and their respective allies, faced off against each other. We've never had an era in which so many countries so rapidly have come on the world scene, each trying to assert its own policy, its own individuality, and to come out from under the domination of the superpowers. The BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India and China now have 40% of the world's population and almost a quarter of global economic power. Look at more broadly what some call the E7, the emerging countries, adding to those four, Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey. With, in less than 10 years, their total economic output will equal that of the old G7 Western democracy. And by 2020, three-fifths of global output will be in Asia. This year, 2012, is a landmark. It's the first year in which global output will be greater in the developing and emerging countries than in the industrial democracies. <coughs> China is an exemplar of this change. In the space of less than 10 years, it's leapfrogged Germany and then Japan first to become the third, then the second largest economy in the world. Brazil, just within the last year, has overtaken the UK, our great ally in Europe, as the sixth largest, and India is the fifth largest country in the world. Our own allies are weakening. <clears throat> Europe, 
obviously, we could go into that in more detail. And in Japan, our strongest ally has gone through a period of stagnation. The rise of China is the great story of the 21st century. It's number one in foreign reserves and exports and manufacture of cars and the fastest supercomputers and the number of mobile phone users and the export of all manufacturing goods and the production of solar panels and wind turbines and even, perhaps humorously, surpassed Italy recently as the largest producer of violins. China is determined to be a world power. It's opened dozens of Confucius institutes around the world to promote its language, training, and culture. And it's extended its economic arm deep into America's own backyard in the Caribbean and Latin America. The capacity of the U.S. to manage a relationship with China will speak volumes about the type of world Jews and Israel will live in. It is a unique bilateral relationship between two vastly different histories, cultures, peoples, with disparate governing systems, and a different concept of organizing society. The so-called Washington Consensus of free market democratic capitalism and the Beijing Consensus of autocratic top-down state-run capitalism. Unfortunately, because we have abandoned our own principles in the Washington Consensus, it lies in tatters at this point. And with the Great Recession, which China has come out from and the developing world much faster, and which Israel really never went into, fortunately for you, we have dug ourselves a very, very deep hole. It may be as late as 2017 before we recover the 8 million jobs we lost in the Great Recession between 2007 and 2009. Uh, with the natural job growth in the economy. The military expenditures by China, Brazil, and India are growing rapidly and beginning again to close the gap with that of the U.S. The rise of so many new powers with so many different interests and cultures complicates the ability of the U.S. upon which Israel has heavily depended to forge a consensus for the kind of world order in which the Jewish people in Israel can continue to flourish. Israel must recognize that while America remains the indispensable world power, it is by no means now the only one. At the same time, permit me to say that the notion of an America in decline can also be exaggerated. We are not like Great Britain was after World War II, a beached whale. We remain the largest economy, the most creative and innovative nation, with the most admired universities there are today, as I speak, over 110,000 Chinese nationals <coughs> in our universities, including a majority of the Politburo's children and grandchildren. Our dollar will remain the world's principal reserve currency for years to come. We're the only country that can project military power by air sea and land across the globe, and our defense spending is greater than the next 15 countries combined. There's an, also no other country in which I would wish to change our problems for theirs. Take China, for example. China is now officially an aging society. Its growth is going to appreciably slow in the next decade. It's facing unprecedented labor unrest and demonstrations against pervasive corruption and cronyism and land grabs by Communist Party officials. Former Asian allies are reacting against the projection of Chinese military and economic power in Asia by coming to the United States for support, as Vietnam has done. China has major ethnic unrest with its Muslim populations in the West and its Tibetan population. Its increasingly large middle class is chafing under the kinds of access limits to the internet. China may be the second biggest country in the world, and it will be well before the middle of the century the largest economy. But on a per capita basis, it's 133rd 
India is 167th. And there may be an unexpected game changer that can at least partially, although by no means totally, arrest this shift in the most unexpected area both for the U.S. and for Israel, and that is energy. Our Middle Eastern policy has been significantly influenced by our dependence on Arab oil. Today we're closer than any time in recent history to genuine energy security. Not because of alternative sources, but rather because of unconventional hydrocarbon production through a process called fracking or hydraulic fracture that extracts oil from limestone and natural gas from shale oil. By 2030, our imports from all countries, in particular from OPEC, will fall from half of our total demand to 22%. And by 2030, we may be the largest producer of oil, natural gas, and biofuels in the world. And we are today, 2012, the number one producer of natural gas. This in turn may power a reindustrialization of America. Israel is very much a part of this new multipolar world itself. Indeed, but for its tiny size, it would stand out as a brick nation with the strongest military power in the region and one of the top ten in the world, a per capita GDP exceeding much of that European Union countries, a world-class technology base, and pioneering technology from drones and agricultural drip technology to software. I was just at Alcatel Luce and I'm on their board for a schooler told me about in Tel Aviv. Cloud band technology, which is the future of computing, is going on at Alcatel, at uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, and it's just one example. Moreover, the old joke that Moses took the wrong turn in the desert when it came to energy is now belied by new realities. Noble Energy, which I've been working, has found three significant natural gas fields. The most recent, the third largest in the last 10 years, properly called the Leviathan. And within 10 years, Israel will be a net exporter of natural gas, attracting investment for LNG facilities from all over the world. If I may offer a suggestion, it's very important that Israel emulate what Norway did when it found unexpectedly tremendous pockets of natural gas in the North Sea, and that is create a special designated fund for education, for infrastructure, for closing your yawning income gap. It is a once in a lifetime opportunity for Israel. It must not be wasted as it often is by energy rich countries who become dependent on their energy like a drug. Given the shifts in power I've described as part of this first dimension, it's essential that Jerusalem deep, deepen its relationships with the brick giants and other emerging countries, particularly in Africa, using its technological capability as its principal calling card. But we have to be realistic. There are real constraints to doing so. China, for example, has a great admiration for Israel and the Jewish people. What it really craves is military technology from Israel, which the Pentagon won't permit to be transferred. India is a fellow democracy, but not, and the third largest supplier of its military equipment comes from Israel. But there has never been a high level visit to Israel by an Indian leader. Brazil, which deserves special emphasis by Israel, which it has not received, is determined to forge its own independent foreign policy. It's moved closer to Iran in troubling ways and it became the first country to unilaterally recognize a Palestinian state based on pre-67 borders with no land swaps. The second global force is globalization. The rapid movement of capital, technology, products, and people across national boundaries powered by the digital revolution. Changing the world as profoundly as Gutenberg's printing press invention did 500 years ago. Every facet of our life is impacted. For sure, there are dark sides of globalization. 
the ease with which digital communications permit the transfer of nuclear technology to rogue countries like Iran and North Korea and potentially to terrorist groups. The facilitation of terrorist organizations planning and financing terrorist activities. The loss of personal privacy, cyber crime and cyber bullying, and the dawn of a new era of cyber warfare. Globalization is also a factor in the increase in inequality on income that we find in Israel and in the United States and in other Western countries. But globalization is also an enormous net benefit to the world and especially, especially to the Jewish people in Israel. The digital revolution has spread to the far reaches of the globe, to villages and towns, ending their isolation from markets, peoples, and power. By 2010, over 4 billion people, almost two-thirds of the world's planet, were cell phone subscribers, and by next year, over 2 billion people in the world will be online. Supply chains for products stretch across the globe. There is no such thing as a purely American, or Chinese, or European, or Israeli product. For example, this phone or your iPhones were produced in seven different countries. And politically, globalization has empowered people long suppressed. It's tremendously important for Israel and Jewish people because with your tiny home market, globalization offers huge opportunities for Israeli companies in a digitally accessible way. <coughs> Israel is at the forefront of this new interactive digital communications revolution. More broadly, though, a more integrated world is a safer world. And what's so unique about this is that this is the first time in history in which so many peoples and so many countries have been mutually dependent on each other's prosperity. Any breakdown, for example, in the supply chain affects people all over the world and products all over the world. We are truly interdependent. And that interconnectivity can break down ancient anti-Semitic stereotypes and integrate the Jewish people in Israel into this new integrated, interconnected global fabric. But even more fundamental, the key ingredient for success in the 21st century globalized world is education, adaptability, entrepreneurialism, and creativity, which are built into the DNA of the Jewish people. They're one of the reasons we've been able to survive the vicissitudes of three millennia that would have overwhelmed the other people. The third global force I examined, and one with the greatest long-term challenge for the Jewish people in the diaspora, particularly in Europe and in the state of Israel, is the struggle for the direction of the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, 400 million of whom live in the Middle East. We incorrectly see this as a titanic struggle, a war of civilizations, or through a narrow spectrum of Islamic terrorism. <clears throat> Certainly there are aspects to that. There are dangerous fringe groups and radical groups with which you have to live that seek to expunge all Western influence from the Middle East and South Asia to create an Islamic caliphate. Jews in Israel are special targets <coughs> and fair game for a battle being played out on a wide panorama around the world from Lebanon and Gaza <coughs> to distant lands like Somalia and Lebanon to Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iraq to Bali and Mumbai to London, Madrid, and yes, New York and Washington, funded often and supported by Iran. But this is a stilted image. If that's the way in which we interact and view the Islamic world, we will be making a tragic mistake. Islam is the world's fastest growing religion, and as of 2011, it became the largest single religion in the world, eclipsing Catholicism. The vast majority of Muslims want nothing more than peace and prosperity. Many live far distant from the major battlefields of, Israeli, of radical Islamists. 
and for them the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is far away from their time and attention. I stress that this battle is much less a war of civilizations than an internal battle for the direction of the Muslim world. Far more Muslims are killed by Muslims than Christians or Jews. It is a battle between the modernizers and the fundamentalists, between those seeking to integrate into the global world and those seeking to destroy it. Two recent UN Arab Human Rights reports, not by Westerners looking condescendingly at Arabs, but rather by Arab scholars, was a blistering attack on how far the Arab Muslim world has fallen behind every area of the globe, including Africa, in every field of endeavor. And when that is combined with a huge youth bulge in which over a third of those in the Arab world are under 20 years old, the spark was only necessary because the kindling wood was already present. The self-immolation of a street vendor in Tunisia provided that spark together with the social media of our globalized world to create a revolution that is every bit as historic as the Central European Revolution against Soviet domination and which will have <coughs> shaking impacts on all of us but in particular on Israel and the Jewish world. Even before the so-called Arab Spring, the Middle East was on an uneasy sword's edge between pro-Western, pro-American countries led by Egypt and the monarchies in the of Jordan and the anti-Western elements led by Iran and Syria. The implications for the Arab revolutions are absolutely enormous. The only two countries with peace agreements with Israel, Jordan, and Egypt are profoundly impacted. You all know the results of the elections in Egypt, and it's entirely possible that the Muslim Brotherhood may control all major branches of power within two weeks. And the revolutionary <coughs> movements are not simply limited to a score of Arab allies of the U.S. who fell like a stack of dominoes in the course of just a few months. We're now in a situation where the uneasy alliances which exist can be thrown up like playing cards coming down in unpredictable ways. And while it's un impossible to predict precisely how this will work itself out, it's quite clear that it could produce an era of winter for Israel and for U.S. influence in the world. Every single country that has held an election, a free election, going back to Gaza and the West Bank in 2006, but more particularly since the Arab Spring, every single one has elected an Islamic government. Some more moderate, some less so, but every single one has done so. Now, it's possible that this may free up the creative powers of the Arab world. It may create governments eager to be part of the globalized world. But for sure, in the near term, the governments coming to power are going to be more distant from the US, less willing to be part of any US-led alliance, are going to hold Israel at even more arm's length, and will be more champions of the Palestinians than the leaders they will For the U.S., the only answer is the one the Obama administration has taken, which is outreach to the new Islamic governments, trying to provide as much assistance as a hobbled America can provide. For Israel, Israel also has a role, indirectly, but still a role, in this unfolding drama of the Arab Spring. While solution to the Palestinian issue will not be dispositive, it can help strengthen modern Islamic and secular forces in the region and deny radicals the recruiting tool. There are some grounds for optimism. In places like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, there are world-class co-ed universities with world-class faculties drawn from 
all over the Western world. None of the countries going through the Arab Spring, in my opinion, will follow the course I saw, unfortunately, firsthand in the Carter White House of Iran after 1979. The newly empowered Islamic governments were not given a mandate for Sharia law. They were given a mandate to provide clean government, good public services, economic opportunities and jobs, and if they fail in this very basic responsibility, the publics will turn on them as they did on the autocrats they ousted. And they know it. And they also know that if they're going to succeed, they have to turn to the U.S. and to the West for economic assistance, for technological <coughs> assistance, and for foreign investment. A fourth external challenge, and one that JPPI has been particularly focused on, is a new form of anti-Semitism aimed at undermining Israel's legitimacy as a Jewish state and seeing Jews as targets, as surrogates for Israel. We've seen this everywhere from the attack on the Chabad house in Mumbai to going back to the 1990s with the uh, double explosions in 92 and 94 against first the Israeli embassy but also the EMEA center uh, in Buenos Aires, which my wife and I saw rebuilt. This new anti-Semitism is not the old religious-based anti-Semitism. It's heavily Muslim-based anti-Zionism. But there is a more recent troubling vintage, generally espoused by left-wing activists and academics, primarily in the U.S. and Europe. I see it on college campuses where I speak which are a hotbed of attacks against Israel, not just specific policies, but against the concept of a Jewish state. What is needed is education of the most basic order to arm Jewish and non-Jewish students and adults with basic elements of history they do not have. It is shocking to see how inadequate our kids are on campuses to answer the most basic uh, charges that are made. Of course, we need to distinguish between legitimate criticism of Israel, which as a sovereign state, all sovereign states must have, and this kind of delegitimization. Natan Sharansky's three Ds is Israel being demonized, held to a double standard, and denied legitimacy remains a good test. I also look at a, a whole series of non-traditional security threats from the environment to demographic changes and cyber warfare. But let me focus on one and then conclude with the internal challenges, and that is Iran's nuclear threat. It obviously is an enormous potential threat to Israel. Some call it an existential threat from a nation publicly committed to Israel's extinction and seeking the means to achieve. Surprisingly, U.S. intelligence agencies since 2007 and reaffirmed in this year, 2012, have refused to find that Iran has made a decision to build nuclear weapons. But there is a clear consensus by both Israeli and Western <coughs> intelligence sources and the IAEA that at the very least, Iran is seeking to become nuclear capable, having all the elements which they can then put together within months to become a nuclear weapons state. This would have, I needn't tell you and I describe in detail in the book, hugely negative consequences for the U.S., for the Jewish people, and for Israel. Every means must be available to deny Iran a nuclear weapon. Even though the U.S. and Europe on the one hand and Israel on the other both share a determination to keep Iran from having a nuclear weapon. And I have to say as a former ambassador to the United States, I would never have believed that Europe would have taken the kinds of stringent, tough actions against Iran that they've done. But having said that, the U.S. administration at every level, civilian and military, opposes a military strike at this time, 
believes that the unprecedented sanctions, and they are unprecedented, against Iran need to be given time to try to bring about a negotiated settlement. And we have the luxury of more time to act if necessary militarily than Israel has. It is critical that the U.S. and Israel align its intelligence assessments and policies. Israel is not alone in facing Iran. The U.S. has assembled a remarkable coalition of countries to combat this. It would be a serious mistake, in my opinion, for Israel to act unilaterally at the very time this U.S.-led coalition is applying unprecedented pressures on Iran. Let me close by saying that it is the internal challenges that pose the greatest dangers. Each of the external threats can be met by a strong Israel and by the diaspora. The way in which Israel and the Jewish people meet its internal challenges will be just as important to our continuity as the external threats. The American Jewish community, with 5 million people, the largest diaspora community, is like an enterprise with two divisions. One very healthy, engaged, involved, at every level, secular and religious and Jewish life, 700 day schools with 250,000 kids, and yet a second division of equal size, morally bankrupt, and threatening the survival of the entire enterprise. This second element of the enterprise is rapidly losing any sense of Jewish identity, ironically assimilating to the point of disappearance at a time when the U.S. increasingly welcomes Jewish identification, intermarrying with low levels of conversion, 52% of all marriages with a Jewish spouse are intermarriages, and only in less than 10% of those cases is there a conversion. Major Jewish institutions are facing a drop in membership, and Jewish philanthropy has significantly declined for Jewish causes. In the JPPI 2011 assessment, which will be out now, there is a brilliant chart which describes the challenges in this respect. Perhaps the greatest internal threat, and it was mentioned by the ambassador, is demography. This is not dry statistics for us in the Jewish world. It is absolutely seminal. We've just reached with great fanfare a global population of 7 billion. The World Bank estimates that by mid-century there will be 10 billion. But the Jewish population of our planet is 13 and a half million compared to 17 million in 1939 before World War II. We've never regained that population. And by mid-century we still will not have regained it if, particularly because of the demographic problems in the diaspora, we can simply stay roughly equal 14, 15 million, if we're lucky, in a world of 10 billion. We will be a very tiny, increasingly small speck in the global world. There is a need in the diaspora for a urgent call to arms. Because with the smorgasbord of lifestyle options now open to Jews everywhere in the diaspora, people, kids, born even to all Jewish couples, will be Jews by choice, not necessarily by heritage. They must be seen to view Judaism as enriching and meaningful in their lives. And therefore, we have to take away all the old preconceptions. We have to reach out in a welcoming way to intermarried couples, even if there's no conversion, and try to fully incorporate them into every facet of Jewish life. Non-Orthodox rabbis should perform intermarriages when couples pledge to raise their children as Jews. Rabbis and Jewish leaders should be proactive in seeking conversions 
And if we define who is a Jew too tightly, we will circle an increasingly small number of wagons. Jewish education in the diaspora is absolutely essential to Jewish continuity and survival. And there needs to be a special emphasis on reducing the enormously high cost of Jewish day schools, which in some cases are as expensive as Ivy League schools. $25,000 to go to the Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School in Washington. And therefore, we have to create a new $2 billion Jewish Educational Endowment Fund. Our Jewish philanthropists give, and if you look at the philanthropic giving, there are studies on this, Jewish philanthropy is wildly out of proportion in terms of our percentages to any other philanthropists. But the philanthropy goes to museums, and to art galleries, and to their universities, and not to Jewish causes. If only 10% of Jewish philanthropy went into this kind of an educational fund, it would transform Jewish education in the diaspora. And the birthright program, which is sending 40,000 kids to Israel for their first identification with Israel, and we now have studies showing that this has dramatically increased Jewish identity and diminish uh, intermarriage. We could double the number, literally double the number of kids coming each year with more funding. And that takes me to the new paradigm. For 60 years, the diaspora gave unstintingly of financial, moral, and political support to Israel, and of course needs to continue to do so. But the new paradigm is, you are now in Israel the largest Jewish community in the world. You and Israel have created a viable, strong, creative Jewish state. And we now have got to see you as the senior partner in this relationship. And that means Israel transforming its own view of the diaspora, not as a place for Aliyah, which is not going to happen in any large numbers, but rather it is essential that the diaspora be strengthened from Israel's own perspective, so it is there as a support system for Israel. And that means on programs like this educational endowment, on birthright, Israel needs to see this as its, in its direct national security interest, as the senior partner in this new diaspora-Israel relationship. Demography has a different meaning in Israel, where Jews have healthy birth rates, by the way, 50% higher than Jews in the diaspora. Ours are below replacement levels. Yours are well above, and not just because of the Haredi. One of my friends, Danny Halpern, has taken care of that uh, himself. Uh, but seriously, you have a very healthy demography. But, as healthy as it is, even though the there is a somewhat of a decline. The birth rates of your Arab population and the Palestinian population on your borders is increasing still faster. Fifty percent of the first graders in Israel are either Haredi or Israeli Arabs. And there's an urgent need to incorporate both the Haredi into the workforce and to improve the lives of your Arab citizens. I close this part and really my, my talk with uh, just two other points. I call it Israel at peace with itself. There is for sure much more that unites Israelis than divides Israelis. Common language, common service in the military, a common sense of people who have a common pride and accomplishments. But the divisions are particularly a concern. Obviously, one of the reasons we have survived for so long is we are famously contentious as a people. This is more tolerable, however, when we are minorities in countries than when there is a Jewish majority and a sovereign state. On very fundamental issues, Israel is not at peace with itself. What does Israel, not the Palestinians, not the U.S., not the West, 
What does Israel want its permanent borders to be? What does Israel want its relationship with its Israeli citizens to be? What does Israel want its final status with the Palestinians in the land they inhabit to be? These were questions that preceded the formation of the state between the revisionists and the more mainstream groups, and it is a division which remains to this very day. Those divisions were in a sense buried for 20 years until 1967, and now with the occupation of Palestinian territories, they come back onto the scene with the secular successors to Jabotinsky joining with religious nationalists and, and the Orthodox to create a new political order in Israel. What had been as a result of a combination of a number of events, this demographic transformation, emigration from the former Soviet Union, the dramatic impact which I see in my own relatives and friends here of the Gaza experience of having pulled out entirely and having not an olive branch extended, but rockets, the threats from both Hamas and Hezbollah. All of these have combined to move Israel from a center-left to center-right country. But still, one goes back to the basic question, is there to be a greater Israel on most, if not all, of the British mandate? Or is there to be a Israel within more, I think, secure borders, securing a Jewish majority. This is a fundamental decision. It can't continue to be put off. Because if it is, the drift of policy will assure that, in effect, that division will not be debated. Now, Israel can't negotiate peace with itself. The Palestinians are too weak, too divided, too unwilling to make the concessions necessary at this point for a lasting peace. But that is no reason for Israel not to show the Palestinians, the new Arab governments, and the world its willingness to seek peace. There is a sense here that the status quo is sustainable. It is not. It would be a tragic mistake to think so. This is the time, even if it is rejected, and it probably will be, to make generous peace proposals and to lay them on the table because the benefits of peace are un often unrecognized or underappreciated. Nothing would more profoundly strike a blow at the pernicious effort to delegitimize Israel as a Jewish state. Nothing would help strengthen moderate forces in the post-revolutionary Middle East and weaken Iran and its radical servants. Let the responsibilities for the lack of peace be on the shoulders of the Palestinians, not of Israel. <coughs> There are also other internal challenges, including the time-honored commitment to the rule of law, support for dissenting voices, full equality for women in secular life, and the defense of a vibrant and robust democracy. Especially troubling internal aspect is the radicalization of the small messianic element of the peaceful settler movement, which openly defies the authority of the Israeli government has built over a hundred outposts illegal under Israel's own law, torches mosques, burns the Koran, poisons Palestinian olive trees, and even attacks Israeli soldiers. And the Prime Minister has properly said they should be treated as terrorists. With all of these challenges, one key element will endure, and that is the unprecedented relationship with the U.S. Unprecedented because the most powerful military and political power in the world has aligned itself so clearly over so many decades and provided so much aid and yes, gotten much in response from one of the smallest democracies in the world. Successive American administrations, Republican and Democrat, have had major disagreements with Israeli policy, some more serious than others. But none have shaken the alliance, and that is because it rests on very firm foundations of general, non-Jewish American public support, which you do not see in, in Europe, because of the activism of the American Jewish community, because of the bipartisan feelings in Congress, which reflects 
the general public support. Because of a surprising range of support from foreign policy elites and the American presidency. So I'm optimistic even about these internal threats because there's so much to build on. If half the diaspora is abandoning Judaism, the other is deeply and intensively engaged. Israel is indeed a remarkable testament to Jewish capabilities. Fulfilling the prophetic vision of Jeremiah 2,500 years ago, after the destruction of the first temple, in which he said, I will gather them from the uttermost parts of the world, the blind and the lame, women with child and women in travail. The company shall come back there, and they have, and they have in our own lifetime. The empires which sought to destroy the Jewish people, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Greeks and the Romans, the Nazis and the Soviets, have disappeared into the dustbin of history. The Jewish people, small although we are, the indomitable, indestructible Jewish people has prevailed and will do so for all time. Thank you.
just human, human humanitarian in nature? Or can we get by by kind of saying, hey, this is a bit too messy. Um, it's, you know, we should stay out of it because... <clears throat> no, I mean, I think that, that there is not either a political or moral imperative for Israel to engage. I think there are imperatives for the U.S. and the West to be more engaged in creating humanitarian quarters uh, and trying to unite the opposition sufficiently to harm them. Uh, and give them aid. Um, but I think the best thing Israel can do is what it's doing is to stay out. Uh, anything it does will be misinterpreted, whether it's humanitarian or otherwise. Yes. Um, Ambassador, um, I'm not sure I understood how you related the issue of the resolution of the Israel Palestinian conflict to your, to your own very interesting uh, address. I must say I was a little, a little bit uh, surprised that in the same great lecture you just gave, you managed to mention both China and the uh, 100 lunatics and hooligans that throw stones or fire Palestinian fields. I mean, in the same lecture to mention both, it's a, it's a kind of uh, a, a misrepresentation or, 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 or loss of proportionality of, of seeing the, 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 the right picture, by the way, a bunch of hooligans that were condemned not only by the Prime Minister of Israel, but also by the Chairman of the Yesha Council and all the settler leadership. But I would like to propose... Well, let me stop you with that. I mean, you, I mean if that's what you got out of it, it's, so, it's uh, an unfortunate... I mean, it's unfortunate statement. I've talked about a series of very different global forces and the no notion that I would be somehow equating China, which takes a whole section of the book in terms of power with I understand Palestinians that is such a gross of course I misunderstanding of what I, I said. I understood that. that never but if you understood it, then why not? Never did that. Yes. <laughs> never did yes. that. I think it surprised me that you, you, you I think that that conclusion of the lecture was a little bit, in my opinion, maybe I'm a bit being a little too blunt, a little bit artificial. Yeah, but let, 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 let me say just the question. Okay. Let me propose to you a different paradigm. That uh, resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the way you wish a division of the country, the establishment of Palestinian state in Israel, Samaria, and Gaza, will do exactly the opposite effect you are seeking. An effect of destabilization of the area, an acceleration of the falling of the Ashima Kingdom of Jordan, and maybe other countries. And if to summarize in one very uh, uh, um, accurate question, I would say, what is your, your strategy for the day after the Palestinian state is created in the summer. How will you prevent that country from being, as Gaza is, the second uh, uh, end political entity that imposed Sharia? Uh, you mentioned Iraq, but you failed to mention also Gaza. Uh, as you know, I'm sure better than me, uh, the Islamic fundamentalist Hamas won the parliamentary elections both in Gaza and the West Bank and in Jerusalem. In the three areas, it, it won a plurality. So, what's your perception? Will the NATO and the United States send forces, uh, mothers in Milwaukee or Amsterdam will send their sons and daughters to Palestine to prevent uh, the democratic election there? Okay, I think that's a very important question. Let me start by saying that the proposition is totally contrary to the 21st century world in which we live, that Israel can permanently occupy two and a half million Palestinians who don't want to be occupied, uh, let alone one and a half million Gazans. It's just, well, it, it's not sustainable. It is contrary to Israel's whole philosophy. Either you make them citizens and you lose the Jewish majority or you keep them permanently suppressed, which is contrary to your own 
background and something they want to learn. So I start from a different proposition. Now, I may end up in the same place you do. Because, as I mentioned, the Palestinian leadership is weak, it's divided. It may be that Fatah's control over the West Bank may be a thing of the past. Egypt is pushing very hard for this pact to actually come into play. And people like Fayyad want peace, they evaporate. If Hamas takes over, there won't be a two-state solution. And I would, I would rather have, with all the disadvantages that it has, I would rather have Israel controlling a West Bank in which Fatah is eclipsed and Hamas becomes the major element, because there's no answer to your question. However, I believe it is possible to negotiate a two-state solution. One, by the way, that your own prime minister endorses that's endorsed by a wide swath wide of the population, and that will have a demilitarized state that will allow Israeli military in key places, not Western military. We've seen, for example, how ineffective the UN is in Lebanon now, um, and that cre create a security ban. We also know that we're not talking about going back to 367 war. Every piece of agreement basically is based on the so-called Clinton parameters. So Bush is supported, you're talking about the large, all the large settlement blocks being within uh, a sovereign state, the land swaps and other areas. So, I mean, the notion that you're going to be dealing with a Palestinian state in pre-67 borders is also not realistic. So I think, again, if there is a Palestinian political leadership willing and capable of making the kinds of compromises that are necessary in terms of demilitarization, in terms of uh, Israeli presence in key areas, then I think there can be peace. If there's not, I would rather have the current situation than roll the dice. Yes. Um, I'd like you to explain more broadly two policy recommendations that you gave that I thought were a little bit potential one another. And that is, I think, that um, welcoming, you talked about intermarriage and welcoming intermarried couples into the community. And at the same time, you also talked about raising the conversion rates. Now, isn't, doesn't such welcoming uh, create a disincentive for conversion? And isn't that one of the reasons for the low conversion rates that we have now is the fact that in the American Jewish community, it's not acceptable <laughs> to talk about intermarried couples convert, uh, converting or you know, to apply pressure of any sort in that way. No, no quite the contrary. I mean, when a intermarried couple, which again is now more than half, and I'm talking about going to weddings, my wife and I, of couples who, these are children, of very Jewishly identified people. If the first expression they have is that rabbis won't even perform the ceremony, even when they pledge, as the non-Jewish spouse is very often willing to do, that they'll raise their kids to Jewish. And then they're told, oh, by the way, if you want to join the JCC, it's, that's okay, but not the synagogue. This is a turnoff. And I don't think conversion can be forced down those throats. But I do believe that if they are incorporated into Jewish life, and they see, and this is evidence of this, and they see the beauties of Jewish life, they themselves, with encouragement, <coughs> But even if they don't, the notion of keeping those couples at arm's length just drives them away from the community, disassociates them, disaffiliates them. And, you know, we're talking about half of Jewish marriages, more than half. In Europe, 60%. So, I mean, I, I see this as entirely consistent and entirely necessary. And it takes a total mindset. It's very hard, and I'm a, I'm a conservative Jew, it's very hard, it's impossible to get, obviously, a orthodox, but even a conservative rabbi will not participate in an air marriage, and very few reform Jews do so, reform rabbis. I just think it's a mistake. We're just past that. We may have had the luxury of your philosophy 15, 20 years ago that, oh, if we, if we allow it, then everybody will do it. It's happening regardless. 
And if we don't face that, we're facing a demographic problem <coughs> of the first order. And when it comes 25 years ago, 25 years from now, I mean, one thing that I didn't mention, and let me mention this. I talked about support for the American public for Israel. 2011 was a landmark in America. 2011 was a landmark because it was the first year in American history that more children were born who were Hispanics, African Americans, Asian Americans, and other minorities than non-Hispanic Caucasians. Four states already have, including California, a minority-majority population.